Americans' rights. And I love him dearly, and I love all the men on this panel just dearly. And I was saying to them earlier, um, Peter, obviously, I've said words about before, but I was saying to them upstairs that I was spent a lot of time this weekend really reading and re-examining and thinking about Steubenville and listening to videos and tapes, and I got so depressed. I literally got into bed and cried for a few hours um, and thought, really, it's hopeless. And I said, no, there are five men. I know they will be on the panel. <laughs> we can move forward. Um, um, and I don't really say that sarcastically sometimes, because um, the situation is we're in right now is really kind of, um, uh, I think, a very big turning point moment. Um, I want to begin with good news, because I think it's always you know, when people criticize your work or give you feedback, it's, you're always much more receptive to listening to their criticism when it comes, when you hear the good news first. <laughs> so I just want to say what I think is good news. Um, Steubenville, um, which was obviously a high school football team um, that committed uh, a rape and uh, was part of a, a, a really kind of community um, event involving um, attacking and um, assaulting a girl who was incapacitated became a, a national moment. And that's the good news. I don't know that this would have happened five years ago or two years ago or a year ago. I really don't. I don't know that in spite of the insane arrogance of uh, the boys and the insane arrogance of a lot of people in the town um, that we would have seen those two boys being convicted um, a year ago even. That's change. That's real change. And it can't be change we take lightly. I don't think we have ever seen the outpouring of brilliant writing, blogging, articles, videos that are happening on the internet right now by amazing people. And I want to say particularly women. I have just seen some of the most brilliant writing in the last weeks done by extraordinary young women on the subject. That is new. That wasn't happening five years ago. All of this is change. And it's change because we have a real movement in the world that's against violence against women. And it's solid. And it's a, it's a woman, uh, movement right now, unfortunately, that is only composed of women, or mainly composed of women. And if we're really going to end violence against women, that has to change. That has to change. Um, I, I want to say that, you know, um, I've been working on violence against women um, probably for the, all my life since I was raped and abused by my own father but particularly for the last 15 years, probably 12 hours a day. I know all the language we use for it, whether we call it rape culture, whether we call it jock culture, whether we call it patriarchy. I can go down the list. I can tell you I've been in war zones. I've listened to stories till they entered my body and changed my body. I still don't know. I still don't know how it is that two boys stand over an imp incapacitated girl and say, this looks like a body that we could urinate on. I don't get it. I honestly do not get it. There is nothing in my body that resonates with that. I have tried to climb into my father, who was abusive. I have tried to climb into other men who were abusive. I've tried to understand the psyche, the feeling, the body, the spirit, what goes. And I honestly do not get it. But you know what? I think that men get it. And that's why this has to be a men's issue. Um, I want to say something that I felt, felt also for a very long time. I don't know how violence against women became a woman's issue, OK? Not only, <laughs> not only do women get raped and battered and undermined and destroyed, but then we have to fix it, OK? <laughs> then we have to clean it up. Then we have to make it better. Then we have to figure out the solution for a problem we didn't create, OK? So what I want to say is tonight, we're going to give the issue back to men. Because this is actually your issue, OK? This is your issue. We are not raping ourselves, it turns out, OK? And I don't say this with anger or malice. I just say it as fact, that if this doesn't become a men's issue, if this doesn't become the men's issue, we are going to see the perpetuation of a society that degrades and degrades and destroys women to the point where life itself is gone. And I want to honor these men. I really mean this for being here, for standing up, for breaking out of the man box, for breaking out of the man culture, for saying we are ready to create another path that may mean we forfeit our status, our privilege in man culture. 
Because that's what it's going to take for, man to, for men to break out of the man box, is the possibility that you will not be at the top of the man culture anymore. And so thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you for being here, and thank you for carving that path. And the last thing I want to say about that is that I think we spend so much time collectively, and I just, even the front page of the Times today with the situation in Egypt, you know, if the women weren't there, if they didn't have an idea, if they weren't in the streets, if they hadn't created the revolution, they wouldn't have gotten raped, you know? Um, I think we have to co decide collectively to stop blaming women for what they wear, for being drunk, for being seductive, for being beautiful, for being in the wrong place with the wrong people, and we have to put the accountability where it belongs on the boys, on the men doing the crimes. We don't need to keep teaching women how to avoid rape. We need to teach men how to stop committing it. And I think that's really the focus of what this evening is about. Um, I want to say that um, we're obviously here today because of Steubenville. And we all pretty much know what happened there. They were convicted. But like the gang rape and the murder of Jyoti in Delhi, and I was just saying to David earlier, I happened to be, when we were doing the One Billion Rising tour, I happened to end up synchronistic, you know, in a very synchronistic way. In India, at the moment, um, Jyoti had been brutally raped and murdered, and was actually there for her vigil in Kerala. And I was at uh, a point in time in India which was actually incredibly um, sad and incredibly heartbreaking and horrific, but also incredibly revolutionary. And I was there when every single newspaper and every single TV station and every single discourse and every single restaurant, there it wasn't one place you went where people weren't talking about sexual violence. And I thought, oh my god, the revolution has begun. You know, because I have never seen a country that was that occupied or preoccupied with sexual violence. And I feel like this could be our moment. Steubenville could be our moment and the moment that awakens America to this situation. And I'm hoping that is the case. What we need to do now is fan the fire. Um, I think it was a, a moment that has really ripped open the underpinnings of misogyny and violence and patriarchy and the connection to sports. And Lori Penny in The um, Statesman argues that Steubenville is rape culture's Abu Ghraib moment. It's the moment when America and the world are being forced, despite ourselves, to confront the real human horror of the rapes and sexual assaults that take place in their thousands every day in our communities. Even this week, for example, at UNC, there was the unveiling of the fact that rape cases and assault cases are not being reported and underreported. At Torrington College, there was yet another situation. At Torrington High School. High School, there was another situation of girls being sexually assaulted of a 13-year-old girl. But the pictures from Steubenville are what's like Abu Ghraib, and they just don't show a girl being raped. They show that rape being condoned, encouraged, and celebrated. Mm -hmm. And what type of culture could possibly produce such pictures? Mm -hmm. So I want to begin with the word or the, or, or the term rape culture. What is it? Mm -hmm. What is rape culture? And, I, and we can just go down the line and jump in. Yeah, first of all, um, hi, everybody. Hi. Uh, <laughs> thank everybody for coming out. Th this event sold out in eight minutes when it was announced. And that in and of, it out, it of itself proves, I think, what Eve said, that we're at a special moment right now. And, 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 I, and I also I want to just personally dedicate tonight to uh, Zerlina Maxwell for daring to say on Fox News right in Sean Hannity's face that the answer to rape and sexual assault is not arming women, which implies that women are responsible for stopping rape, but actually teaching men to not rape. So thank you, Zerlina Maxwell, Absolutely. for doing that. And, and I, I want to make sure everybody gets a chance to talk, so I'm not going to filibuster here. But just to say that, to me, rape culture, very simply, is not the two boys in Steubenville who committed the crime, it was the 50 people who saw it happening and did nothing. That's what rape culture is. It's the coach who winked and said it was okay and that everything would be taken care of. 
It was the original judge who had to be recused because he was connected to the football program. It was the police who didn't want to investigate that it was going to happen. It was the parents. It was the women and men who've been threatening this young woman for daring to come forward and say something. And honestly, it's an entire, what is rape culture? It's culture is what it is. It's our culture. It's what happens to our culture when we let it sit and don't actively challenge violence against women. Without actively challenging it, that's what allows rape culture to fester and to survive. Without our active intervention, this will continue. So that's what rape culture is to me. It's the norm which will continue to grow and fester without us standing up against it. Thank you. Tony. Yeah, I won't be redundant uh, because uh, David said a lot. So I'll just add to what, what he shared maybe a little. And for me, I mean, there's the outward examples which uh, David just gave uh, that really, you know, builds up the rage in us that we can point to that's more tangible and measurable that we can speak to. But what I would add to that is the stuff that goes on in the minds of men. As a man, I know. It's been in my mind, right? And, and it's with all I know and all who I choose to be, that doesn't mean it's not, it's completely out of my mind. We was talking about breaking out of the man box. For me, at this point in time in my life, it's more about knowing when I'm in the box mm -hmm. and when I'm out of the box. It's like I'm no longer on remote control. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? I, I kind of know what I'm doing in the moment when I'm doing it. I'm, I'm making conscious choices at this point in time in my life where many men are still on remote control. And so to add what Dave, uh, David just shared is, for me, is about what's in the minds of men in addition to that. So you have the men who we could point the fingers at in different situations, and then you have a whole critical mass of us that in our minds we're saying, what was she doing there? Why was she drunk? What was she, and we never say a word. We never say a word, but in our mind we'll run down the list of all things that we who do this work would know is re-victimizing her. But, you know, uh, but we'll run down that whole list, that whole gamut of things that in the end will support the behavior of the offenders. Mm -hmm. That's great. Well, I would say, I, I think you see three ingredients in Steubenville that supports a rape culture. One is the, the lack of moral clarity about what the response should have been by both the men and the women uh, that were there. The second thing is a lack of moral courage, the inability to stand up and speak out of some kind of moral ethical conviction. And I think the third thing is just the incredible lack of empathy. Mm -hmm. uh, empathy is part of our human nature, but it has to be nurtured. Mm -hmm. and I think there's something in the socialization of men that represses the empathic response that you did not see uh, in the midst of that. So rape culture, more lack of moral clarity, uh, lack of moral courage, and you know, which is incredible in sports. We spend so much time talking about physical courage. It's really the, the moral uh, uh, courage that needs to be uh, elevated and coached and taught, and then we have to we have to nurture uh, empathies. You know human nature, but this culture wants to repress it, particularly uh, in men. So I think those are three of the components that sustain the uh, rape culture. It's excellent, John. Jimmy? Sorry, you got the end of this line. <laughs> the last person. <laughs> such we'll I'll start with you next time. Yeah. Um, yeah. The, but just, I think just to amplify what they've all said, um, and I think, and really Dave said it so cogently, I think rape culture is our culture. I mean, and men and women involved. Um, I think Steubenville is an extreme manifestation of that culture, but I don't think, you know, I think we have to be careful tonight. It's very easy for us sitting here in New York right now to, to judge or condemn Steubenville, condemn a, a town in the Midwest, but, you know, what happens in Steubenville happens every single day in this country and in the world and in, in this city. And I think it's not about, it's not about a, a depressed town in the Midwest. I mean, it's about what we're telling young people. And, I think you know our culture has failed. We we failed the perpetrators. We we failed the victim for sure in Steubenville, because you know our society is one that tells young people, you know, we do it, do it every day through our advertising. We tell young people uh, sex and alcohol go together. We tell young people that the best way, to, for, especially for young men and men, to bond is through violent action manifesting, especially through sex, sex, uh, sexual violence. Um, and we t I mean we we don't we don't foster um, or support empathy or sensitivity in young people. You know, those, those boys, those assailants in, in Steubenville 
are not unlike the, you know, the boys here in this city or anywhere else in this country. But I think, you know, to Joe's point, what was missing was the empathy and moral courage. But I think that's missing in, in, throughout this country, throughout this culture. You know, we don't support, you know, when, 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 when young men or boys at 11, 12 years old and they want to express their sensitivity or emotions, we tamp it down. We tell them to, to be a man, to be masculine. You know, you, don't, you know, you have to be strong, you have to be physically strong, independent. You can't show your feelings. You have to, you have to buck up, you know, and in the neg negative connotation, we told them to man up. Um, and we don't allow them the space as a culture to, to be sensitive, to be empathetic, to be moral. Mm. Peter, do you want to? I would just back it up to about five or six years old as opposed to 11 or 12 oh, years old. No. And uh, otherwise, I'll take the Facebook prerogative and like all of these four <laughs> answers. <laughs> David, you want to? Yeah, just I really want to support what Jimmy said about this not being a Steubenville issue and us needing to see this as national issue, global issue. But there, there are lessons in Steubenville that are generalizable, though. I mean, you're talking about a town of 16,000 people with a football stadium that seats 10,000. You're talking about a state in Ohio that's seen a massive population reduction with the loss of industrial jobs. A city like Cleveland, jobs down 17 uh, percent. I mean, I'm sorry, uh, population down 17 percent in the last decade. And you're talking about, I think that there is a, a crisis in this country about what it means to be a man. And that there is a, a confusion about that. And one of the results of that, and this is not to excuse but to explain, to be very clear, but one of the things that I think results from that is a projection of men onto boys who play violent sports, um, particularly football, although not always football, where these young boys who are sometimes you know, 12, 13, 14 through high school are deified mm -hmm. and basically, they're basically paid in worship for the, for the projected frustrations of adults, which in and of itself is a form of warping and abuse, which can lead to absolutely terrible um, decisions and the very rape culture that we're discussing. Yes, Jimmy. I, I, don't, I don't know if the other panelists have had this, this same feeling, but throughout the whole Steubenville situation, um, and as the story unfolded, I've had this sense of deja vu. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know if you recall 25 years ago in Glen Ridge, New Jersey, mm -hmm. which was immortalized in um, the book Our Guys, mm -hmm. something very similar happened. Mm -hmm. um, a developmentally challenged young woman was raped, assaulted in someone's basement. Yep. Um, the town tried to cover it up. No one believed her because she was developmentally challenged. And because the, the, the assailants were athletes, it took a long time for the truth to emerge. And that was 25 years ago. And I just feel like, you know, with Steubenville, you know, I feel like it's, it's because of social media, it's, you know, it, it had this, very, this immediacy where the world could respond to it and outrage as justifiably. But my fear is that it's gonna happen again mm -hmm. until we decide, that, until we make the, the, the true commitment for that cultural transformation. And, and to your point earlier, I think, you know, men, you know, this is a, this is a men's issue, but it's more than that, it's, just, it's a human issue. Right. Mm -hmm. You know, it's not women's or men, it's just a human issue, human rights issue. Mm -hmm. And I think that, you know, you know, we have to do our work as men, but we have to do the work with women as well. Absolutely, I wasn't saying it was gonna yeah. be, but I just wanted to bring men into the yeah. story, you yeah. know. Um, yeah. mm -hmm. I, I, just, I just wanna just address something he was saying about being a man, because I think, that's kind of at the core of everything that's going on here. And we were talking about earlier of, of what it means to be a man right now. What is a man? And I think it's really up for grabs. I think it's a huge question. And, and, and we were talking also earlier about a place like Steubenville where the steel industry used to be strong and, and potent and it was, it, people had, you know, were doing fairly well economically. And, that, and since the steel industry has left, there is great hardship in Steubenville. So there, in, in James Gilligan's book, he talks a lot about, it, and he wrote two books, one called Violence and one called Preventing Violence. And he worked with criminals, um, he worked with incarcerated, incarcerated men who were there for violent crimes, and he worked with them for many years, and to get at the core of why men were committing violent crimes. And what he discovered was that shame and humiliation were the two main factors at the core of violence, and all kinds of shame and humiliation, economic injustice, racial injustice, homophobia, um, ethnic injustice, you know, all kinds of it. And he began to really work with men looking at those factors and helping them transform. And he discovered that 
men who began to tap into those parts of themselves and did work did not come back to prison and stopped committing violent crimes. So I would just like you all to like talk about what, what are the intersections of economic injustice and violence in terms of manhood and the other intersecting issues, and what does it mean to be a man right now? Who's defining that? I would say, that I, think it, I think we need to make sure though it transcends social economic mm -hmm. realities. Mm -hmm. I think the three scariest words that every man receives in his lifetime is when he's told to be a man. Mm -hmm. And as Peter said, five, six, seven years old. That's almost always in the context of stop with the feelings, stop with the emotions, stop with the tears, don't be a sissy, some kind of mama's boy. And I think boy, boys at a very early age are taught that to have emotions, to show them, to share them, those things are signs of masculine failure. So you have boys at a very early age separating their hearts from their head. And the problem with this is uh, if you don't understand your own feelings and emotions, you'll never understand the feelings of emotions of another human being. Mm -hmm. yeah. So I, I, I think this is at the very root of it. And I'll, I'll let Tony uh, uh, speak to that, but uh, we have to change that. That mandate to be a man has to be given in an entirely different context with an entirely different meaning. And I do want to get back at some point, I don't think there's a better venue to help eradicate gender violence maybe in America than sports when done correctly. Mm -hmm. But I'll let Tony speak to the manhood issue. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, there's a couple of things come up for me. When you were speaking about empathy, you know, uh, that we don't have enough as men, I think, and then we talk about manhood in of itself, part of manhood, and I'll, I'll, I'll take that, what you said, and put it in a different context, is that men are taught not to have an interest in the experience of women. Mm. Mm. Uh, mm. And if you demonstrate an interest in the experience of women, because mm. when we talk about this man box, the glue that keeps the box together is homophobia. Mm. All right, and so it's very, very challenging for men to demonstrate an interest in the experience of women. Mm. You know, I have a 14-year-old son, Kendall. You know, based on the definitions of manhood, if he has five, six girls that are friends of his and they're over the house and they're just hanging out, when I look and zone in, I want to know which one he likes, right? <laughs> that, that's, that's core to manhood. It's cool that there's five of them there, but which one does he like, right? Mm. Mm. And if he doesn't like any of them, we got a problem, mm. all right? Because if he doesn't like any of them, then the questions arrive, so then why would he be interested in being with five of them? Mm. All right, so we're mm. taught as men to just have this clear disconnect. Now, that lack of interest only becomes important in regards to sexual conquest. That's when it's okay. So if you're on a college campus and you walk past a, a women's studies course, and you look in the room and you see three men in there and 30 women, for us as men, we like come back and take a double take to try to make sense of this. And the things we'll come up with, well, the men in the room are gay, or the men in the room found an interesting way to meet women and earn three college credits at the same time, right? <laughs> if it's neither of those, if they're there because they're interested in the experience of women, that shakes up the dynamics of, of, of manhood. But so, are men interested in the experience of women? Many may be, many yeah. may be, but they're challenged to expose that. Mm -hmm. They're challenged to expose it, they're challenged to speak to that, which creates a lot of the silence that we see when we talk about men's violence against women in general. Mm -hmm. yeah, I, I, have a, I, I have a friend named Cindy, and she has two teenage boys as sons, There's her sons, and uh, they came to her one day and said, Mom, how do we know if a girl wants to have sex with us? And she said, if you're not sure, she doesn't. <laughs> and I, I think, and I think like the idea, the idea of putting her thoughts and her agency front and center in your mind is the best education mm -hmm. we can give to young men and boys. And given how remarkably sexist our culture is, I really do believe that without the active intervention of adults, particularly adult men who are standing up against a rape culture and saying to these young boys, how do you know if she wants to have sex? She will tell you if she does. Without that, we are, we are in trouble to see this cycle continue, as Jimmy said. I'll, I'll stop there. Sorry. Mm -hmm. No, I was just going to say, I mean, I, I think, um, I, I think there are, <clears throat> I think there are examples 
of positive manhood in society and the, our culture, I think, I think the, the, the struggle is to affirm those, those represent, representations of manhood. Um, Can you give some examples? Well, it's interesting today, before coming here actually, I was watching C-SPAN, um, though listening to C-SPAN and then watching it because they had the oral arguments for the, for the um, Prop 8 Supreme Court case, which is fascinating. And it was interesting after the, you know, after they, they played the audio, they, they, you know, they had the demonstrations outside and the opponents of Prop 8, just seeing who they were, seeing that coalition of people of all races, economic backgrounds, men, the football player from the Ravens spoke, um, this, I forget his name. You Brandon know, Ayambadeo. Brandon Ayambadeo. spoke eloquently. Yeah. It was just amazing to see, you know, first of all, to see, you know, all these, you know, <laughs> so these athletes, professional men, standing up on this issue. Mm -hmm. um, and I think, I think that you know, we do have examples of positive man in society, but we have to affirm them. And I think we have to, you know, it goes back to what Peter was saying, whether it's five or six or 11, 12, I mean, there's tremendous research, and we know the, who they, who's done the research, Michael Kimmel, Carol Gilligan, Naomi Way, research about you know, boys' emotional uh, life in childhood. And we know, I mean, they're, they're telling us in childhood, in middle school and elementary school, I'm a sensitive, I care, I want to play with dolls, I want to wear, wear these colors, I, I don't, these colors aren't gendered to me, but at a certain point, as, as Tony and Joe point out, you know, we, we gradually grind that out of them, you know, to, to conform to this, 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 you know, this broad definition of manhood, which is ultimately destructive. Mm -hmm. And it's men, I mean, men do this. You know, men do this. And your example is a good example, but there needs to be a man saying that to those boys. But I think, I I think, think the women, too, women do it as well. They, they, even, even when they're doing it, when they're doing it, and they do, but they're operating based on the norms of how we as men define manhood right. and right. What, what works for us. Sure. So I, I, even the things that women do do, I, I, I believe that if you just look one layer below, you still find the benefactor being men. Of course. Mm -hmm. of course. You know, uh, but we as men will point that out because that's when, we, when we're looking for a past, we'll look and say, well, you know, women do do, and they do, but they're operating in a male-dominating culture and responding to what we respect in men, particularly when they're raising their boys. In many cases, they're raising their boys to be respected by, and work, by us and working yeah. with what they, what they have, and they're not men, but then we as men will go back and say, well, women do it too. Yeah. You know, they do it, yeah, they do it, but it's still, you know, the roots of it is, is still wrapped around male, male domination with us being the benefactors. I, I want to say that, Tony, not to blame one or take a pass, but just that you know, the, we have to do the work ourselves, mm -hmm. but also making sure women are part of that conversation as we're doing the work. Yeah, I'm with you on that. Yeah. Let, me, uh, let me define masculinity, give you my definition. I think first to understand that there are three fundamental cultural lives that every boy is fed in this country. And the first one is this, and I think every boy learns by the time they're eight, nine years old. They learn this on ball fields and playgrounds all over our community. And that is we associate masculinity with issues of athletic ability. Mm. Somehow we associate it with size or strength or some kind of skill set that allows you to compete on that playground and win. The boys that have athletic interests, abilities, they're elevated. The other boys in that playground are pushed against the peripheral of the playground impregnated with this idea at eight, nine years old that they don't have what it takes to be a man. Mm -hmm. By the time a boy is in junior high school today, they're taught in this culture that masculinity has something to do with a, a sexual conquest. Uh, either using girls to va va validate some kind of masculine insecurity or some kind of physical gratification. The third lie every man is taught is that in America we associate masculinity with issues of economic success. Mm -hmm. As though you can measure a man based on job title, position, title. And we live in a country where all kinds of men associate their self-worth with their net worth. So I'll give you my definition because I think every boy needs some clear and compelling definition that's gonna guide their masculine soul because there's so many ma masculinities in here. Now I've been in pastoral ministry for 30 years and I do an awful lot of funerals. And here's my two criteria that define what it means to be a man and they're exact same two for what it means to be a woman. It's about our common humanity. And the first is this, I think at the end of life, everybody recognizes life is about the capacity to love and to be loved. Mm. It's all about relationship. What's it mean to be a man? It means you can enter into relationships, look somebody in the eyes and say, I love you and give that love back. 
the second thing that defines all of us as men and women is all of us have to have some kind of cause in our life that's bigger than who and what we are. We all have a responsibility to give back in this world to make the world more fair, more just, more inclusive, more hospitable for every human being. So I'm defining masculinity uh, uh, to coaches, the boys I work, it's relationships and it's commitment to a cause. Beautiful, mm. beautiful. You frame the question with a word that sent off all the alarm bells for me in, in the sense of if I had to define it with one word in terms of what is a man, it would, it would be around potency. Mm. It's the need to feel potent, whether it's on the field or in the bank or with a woman. It, that seems to be a core need, desire, function, something. Mm -hmm. Wall, field, bedroom, built Right, mm -hmm. right. Yeah. yeah. But, but, I, but I also think that that's so cultural and learned. I mean, it's, some, it's, it's a construction around us that says this is how you defi we define manhood. And I think that we can set about redefining it and educating. I mean, first of all, if we thought that this was a lost cause, I don't think this event would have sold out in eight minutes, first right. and foremost. You wouldn't have this outrage. You wouldn't have us gather here today. If, if this truly was a lost cause, you wouldn't see uh, the fact that education actually works in communities, that you see in different countries, the rates go up and the rates go down. Different campuses, they go up, they go down. This doesn't happen by accident. It happens because of active intervention. It happens because of movements, and this, this connects with what Joe said, but I'll say it explicitly. I think we have to define masculinity as a man who's willing to fight sexism. Mm. And it, mm. the, it's the, if that, and, and you want to feel potent, feel potent standing up with your sisters uh, oh, yeah. for, oh, for a better, more yeah. just yeah. world. Yeah. And, exactly. well, manhood right. is not, and I think what we teach our boys in its simplicity is that manhood is a dehumanization of women. Mm -hmm. We don't say that, mm -hmm. but almost every, not almost every, but far too many examples of how we define manhood are rooted in the dehumanization of women. And wouldn't and, you also say it's about not being a woman? It's not, not, well, because we know men are not women, well, right? We, we? we, we work, you know, you know what I'm saying. We Maybe work. they are. Yeah, watch we, it, Tony. Yeah, I'm watching, I'm watching, I'm watching. <laughs> Help me out, Joe. What's we happening to men is we're, <laughs> we're working real hard. We're working real hard. <laughs> Not to be. <laughs> and we take it to extremes, you know, because the further the extreme we are, the more, in many cases, we can bolster our, our manhood. So we may very well take it to extremes. I want to go back to something in regards to what uh, one of the men was talking about, Steubenville. Uh, I think it was you, Jimmy, about not getting caught up there. Because this is what we do as men. We, we're, we're very, I believe we're purposeful. I, I don't know how much is happening on the subconscious level, but it's purposeful and it's very structured in our society, the us against them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Meaning good guys mm -hmm. versus bad guys. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? And we'll find out, we, we look to find our place, obviously in that good guy category, and in many cases, we define good guys versus bad guys by what's legal and what's illegal. While we as good men, we, we lean against that line all the time, far too often. Mm -hmm. We cross that line, hope we don't get caught and jump back on the other side of the line, far too often. Uh, we think about a lot of things that we don't do. We believe in a lot of things that we dare not do. But because the way it's structured, we get to play the game of good guys versus bad guys. Uh, for me, that's real muddy. You know, you know when, we, when I look at men who perpetrate violence against women, of course they did something wrong, and of course they need to be held accountable. And, you know, particularly older men, you know, with boys, I get a little jammed up because they're really operating based over what we taught them. But they still need to be held accountable. Nine out of time it was a girl, right? They need that they victimized. They need to be held accountable. But in holding them accountable, the rest of us cannot continue to be left off the mm -hmm. hook mm -hmm. as if we have absolutely nothing to do with it. And that's the way the system is set up, mm -hmm. that we have nothing to do with it. So when we talk about the chain we want to see, I want to see this room full of men instead mm -hmm. of full of women. Absolutely. There's a handful of men here. I want to be here. invited. <laughs> I speak all over the country and the call the men we, we've spoken and participated in, in events and 
you know, many countries around the world, but nine out of 10 times, we're always invited by women. Okay, so let's talk about that. This is, this is something I'm plagued with, okay? Why aren't the men who are conscious, who know what violence against women is, where are they? Where are they? Why aren't they standing up? What is going on? I mean, really, Jimmy, go ahead. If, if, I, I think, and I know you know this, but I mean, they are there and they are standing up. No, they're not, Jimmy. No, they're not. No, let me finish. No, let me Jimmy, finish. they're let me, not. I'm going to disagree with you. Let me finish. <laughs> let me finish. <laughs> Hear me out. Hear me out. And I say that because, you know, there, there are men who've been out there for a long time writing about this issue. Michael Kim, Michael Kimmel, Gilligan, and others. You can me, name them. You, That's you the can. problem. But, but that, but that, well, that <laughs> <laughs> you can name them. You have to be a formidable foe. I want to disagree with you because, I mean, I, I, mean, I, I don't know. I would disagree because, you know, you know, with Man Up, you know, I came to Man Up, I started Man Up a short time ago, five years ago, so I'm new to the space. But you have, you have coalitions like Men Engage, which are working in every continent in the world. Uh, led by Gary Barker and other others. You have a call to men, you have Men Can Stop Rape, you have Raven in St. Louis, you have, you have men's organizations that have been out there for 20, 30, 40 years. They haven't got been in the spotlight, they haven't gotten the claim, they haven't gotten the press attention, but they've been out there. I think the problem is that the men have not been talking to each other and supporting each other and, and holding, up, holding up this work. The work's been happening, it hasn't been happening Jimmy, as long, it hasn't I, been happening just, as, long I, as the, the women's movement against violence has been happening, but, the, but men have been out there. Yes, we need more men out there for sure, but we also need just to start working with not just men and young men, but with boys in school. No, but Jim, Jimmy, I don't disagree with you yeah. that there are fantastic groups doing this work, and I'm going to list them at the end. They're, but I travel around the world, okay? I travel. I do, I've done this work 20 years, and just like Tony, you have an event like this. I have had a million events like this. Men do not come to these events. They don't, Jimmy. And we've tried every different approach. Now, I'm, I, I'm not blaming. I'm just saying this is where we are. This is where we are. I want to ask the question, what is keeping men from coming forward to make violence against women their issue, their central issue? Their mothers are being raped. Their daughters are being raped. Their sisters are being raped. Their wives have been raped. You know, what is the, and that's the question well, I'm putting. We, we, first of all, we, again, we have to go back that we're in a society still today where men are socialized and have a lack of interest in the experience of women. Many so talk about that. Talk about many, that. In many occasions when we talk to men, we, what we, at a call to men, we, we, we term it reaching in and grabbing their heart. We cannot do that in a generic conversation about women. So we may ask them questions like, uh, envision the world you want to see for your daughters. How do you want to see men acting and behaving in that world? That will make a man who's slopped, you know, sloping in his chair sit up and pay attention. We reach in and grab his heart. You know, that's one way to get to men, uh, is through that experience. It puts a lot of what they believe at times in conflict, you know, but that's not gonna, that in of itself is not gonna reach the critical mass yeah. of men that's right. that we wanna yeah. reach, you know. That's just one, that I could work that in this room, but that's not gonna reach the critical mass of men. Yeah. So the critical mass of men, in, in many respects, we are clearly stuck in a socialization, you know, that has not only demonized women, but will demonize us for joining forces with women. Mm -hmm. And so a, it could even be, it could be defined as a profit, not a profit, a loss, but a, a loss in benefit, you know. What's the benefit? You know, what's the benefit mm -hmm. for men to be here in a critical mass, you know? Mm -hmm. it, it's a fair question to be in, begin to ask based on how our society operates. What would be the benefit for men if this room was full of men? Outside of their daughters and their mothers? Outside, wouldn't that be know? enough? The, the, check it out, but that's a fair <laughs> question. Right. What's the benefit for me to be here? Mm -hmm. You know? Because yeah. you know, I just say, men are sent the message that to stand up for women, you are gonna pay a societal price for doing that. And without having role models, people they look up to who say, no, that price is worth it, then obviously I think the default action is going to be to not do that. I mean, I'll tell you, I, I, I'm a Jew who believes very strongly in Palestinian liberation. I'll just tell you guys that. And, and I'm just saying, like, and I'm not asking for applause and you don't have to applaud, but I'm saying that there is, yeah. It's like, thank you. No, it's, but it's like, <laughs> but it would, be, it would be crazy to say that there is not a price Absolutely. In my community, for talking about that, of course there is, you know, and, and it, it's but in doing. And anytime you talk about 
if you want to call it crossing over, if you will, white person speaking out against racism, whatever it is, it's like th there, there are prices to be paid for doing that. They, they didn't kill John Brown just because they didn't like him. They killed John Brown because he died to fight slavery. So it, it's, it, these messages are, are ingrained in our history. But if, if, there's, if there's one thing I would say is I think institutions, if we want to reach this critical mass, institutions yes. that men look up to need to start carrying the weight of this. The National Football League needs to devote a billion dollars to doing, to doing training to fight violence against women. Yeah. And you know what? It would be smart business for them too because they want women, women's money. They want women viewers of the NFL. Sure. And so what do they do every year? They take a month and dress all the players in pink and say, we're doing a partnership to fight breast cancer. Look, Michael Vick is wearing pink shoes. Don't we all feel better? And, and it's like, no, if you really, if you really want to do something and make a serious, take accountability for the fact that there is a rape culture connected to football mm -hmm. and say, you know what, it's not automatic that it's connected, that rape culture and football is connected. So we're actually gonna steer it in the other direction by devoting a billion dollars to high schools to do rape prevention education. Okay, so that would I, make I a think difference. that should come out of this evening, right? right? I think it's a great idea. Can I, can I put a, <laughs> I just wanna I put a little spin on that though. Yeah, sure. Cause <laughs> I believe that there, there's a rape culture <laughs> Uh, entwined in athletics in general. I don't, I, I don't, I'm not a fan of demonizing the NFL. I'm just not a fan of that. Uh, because uh, we're letting off a, a lot of other sports off the hook. And I'm gonna say it, I'm, I don't care, I'm gonna say it. The NFL is, a, <laughs> NFL is about 90% black men. All right? Yes. Now I know the NBA 70. has, you know, probably higher, 70. but come on. Hockey, which is about 99 and a half percent white men, <laughs> they don't come up in any conversations about mm -hmm. anything. Mm -hmm. You know, Fair Major enough. League yeah. Baseball, no conversations about nothing. So, the sport, and I know football is a very aggressive sport, and I understand how domination is supported by aggression and the whole concept of no fear and power and control and, and, and all of that. I, I, I'm with all of that. But it's about athletics in general. Okay. Okay, so let's, let's get $5 billion dollars right. from but, all that. Right. I think, I mean, well, right. first I was going to say something else, but <laughs> thank you for saying that, Tony, because I think in often in these discussions, um, we don't talk about race in manhood or race and gender. And there is a lot of, I mean, there is a lot of work happening around black manhood, especially with boys, uh, working with black boys. But what's been missing to this point is the gender component of the discussion. Um, and I also think that, again, just piggybacking on what, what Tony just said, um, we have to look at this holistically. I mean, I didn't know that Joe was a, was a, was a pastor, but I love that. Because, but no, because, because we, you know, we need to broaden our view of who, right. where we reach people. Mm -hmm. I mean, we can't just reach, reach boys through sports or through high school or through mm -hmm. school. We have to reach, reach, reach young men through the pulpit as well. So we go to the mosque, we go to the synagogues, we go to the churches. We need to broaden this coalition of partners so that this message is co coherent. Mm -hmm. And because we're not gonna, going into a school, uh, developing, a, developing a curriculum uh, against rape for high school boys, it sounds great, but I'm not sure what the long-term impact will be when those boys go back home or go back to their communities right. Right. and society reinforces to them, you know, okay, this is what you learned in school, but in the hood or on the corner or whatever, on the block, on the field, this is how you're supposed to act. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's institutional. I mean, that's the thing. You talked about institutions, then you went straight to sports. But it is, it's the church, it's the advertising industry, it's the film industry. It's, you know, you can't look in. That's why it's rape culture, and that's why it is the culture, because it isn't just sitting in sports. It sits everywhere. You go to Times Square, and if you don't look up at those billboards, and, that's right. you know, it's... Where, so, so the men you want to get to are the men in the institutions that might just pull the pillars out from That's underneath right. it. I mean, mm -hmm. it's... I think in this, uh, in the Steubenville, you know, looking at sports, uh, I, w I don't consider the NFL, Major League Baseball, the NHL, they're not sports, those are businesses. Mm -hmm. Sports really, sports that are tied to educational institutions are an educational uh, tool to help train, guide boys. It ought to be about moral, ethical values. It ought to be about mm -hmm. social, emotional mm -hmm. development. That's the purpose of sports. Now, what we have moved into in the last 10, 15 years is this win-at-all-cost kind of mentality mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. in youth sports on up. Mm 
Mm -hmm. and we need to reclaim sports. Sports have always been a metaphor for social change in this country. You think of the millions of immigrants that have gotten off boats integrated mm -hmm. through sports. Every ethnic group that's ever been ghettoized, sports has created a pathway out. When you talk about civil rights, when you talk about women's rights, you talk about human rights, you think of the role that sports and athletes have played in bringing some of those issues into mainstream political consciousness. So what we need to look at today is what is the role of sports mm. in America and who is it serving? Mm. Is it about the healthy uh, development? Mm -hmm. And so I'm with Jimmy, I'm, I'm pretty optimistic. I think there's an awful lot of men mm -hmm that want to make a difference. I think those men need permission. Mm -hmm. They need their hands held. But I work with tremendous numbers mm -hmm. of coaches that are now teaching young boys about gender violence and using the platform. Coaches have this almost unparalleled platform position in the lives of young people. Mm -hmm. And what you've got to do is no program's going to fix this, but it has to be a multi-systemic perspective. Mm -hmm. in the sense that every young person is embedded in multiple systems. Mm -hmm. They have a family system, a school system, a peer system, a faith system, a sport, recreation, and all of those systems have to be brought together with one coherent, consistent message. So you have multiple points of intervention. So when that child starts playing t-ball at five, six years old with a mom, dad, coach, that's the time to start teaching them age-appropriate messages about the socialization of, uh, of men and start giving them. Then you walk kids from t-ball through 8, 10, 10, 12. There's, there's 20 to 30 million children that play sports in this country. There's another 10 million that play interscholastic. Mm -hmm. That's an incredible venue. Mm -hmm. If we could reclaim that uh, as a tool to promote social change uh, and to empower every bystander, uh, I, I think then we've got a solution. But it takes everybody working together. Mm. If programs could fix things in America, they would have been fixed a long time ago. Mm. 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 That's great. And, and, Jimmy? I mean, too, I, mean I know, we're, you know we're talking about the context, of the frame of Steubenville and what happened there. But I really think it should be, we should really look at this as disempowerment. Because I think what happened in Steubenville is a manifestation, it's a spectrum. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, 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 I put Steuben, what happened in Steubenville on the spectrum of misogyny, uh, the everyday oppression that we accept which happens to women, the sexualization of women. Um, I, I consider the fact that we had to wait so long for VAWA to pass a form of violence. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know? Yeah. yeah. Um, and I mean, we, have, we can't, I mean, what happens to people is horrible, but that's a spectrum. And I think by, by, I think Tony and Joe said it before, by always focusing on these horrible graphic incidents, which we should, we have to focus on those, but put, put them in context and not let ourselves off the hook, the good guys, but also as Peter said, the institutions. I mean, Wall Street, Fifth Avenue, I mean, the, adver the advertising, the messages they were constantly sending out to young people about sexuality, conflicting manhood, uh, violence. Mm -hmm. We saw it in Newtown as well, the manifestation mm -hmm. of that. I mean, we're, we're all accountable. Yeah, yeah if, and if I could jump in on that in terms of looking at it holistically, I, I was glad that the two young men were found guilty in Steubenville because, if for no other reason, the defense's case was that incapacitated and drunk equals consent. And if on that cultural platform, if a judge had said not guilty, the effects of that would have been insanely Insane. harmful. Insane. So let's, let, let me just be very clear about that. Uh, that being said, I also have no illusions that the criminal justice system in this country will Hello. do anything Hello. Uh, for these young men. No. And I think that's part of looking at yeah. this holistically, mm -hmm. is we have to start talking about restorative justice mm -hmm. in this country. Absolutely. We have to... Um, if we're just talking about the act of sexual violence, the highest rape rates in the United States are in the prisons. Absolutely. And, and, there, and it connects with a lot of the issues we're discussing mm -hmm. about manhood and who's top dog and all the things And also not to mention culture. that the majority of women who are in prison are there because they've been violated. Yes. So we're talking about these two prison systems that yes. are constructed on violence, you know, yes. and, 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 and violence in the background, violence in every direction. I think know? the other issue that needs to get thrown in here is the whole issue of uh, pornography. Mm -hmm. The average age of a first time view is an 11 year old boy in this country. Or you have mer neurons, the bestiality, the brutality, the denigration of girls and, uh, 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 and women in those. I think that's playing a huge part, and uh, I, I think that you're seeing that manifested across this country. I mean, it, it goes to this empowerment argument. I mean, it's the same thing as. I mean, well, let me let me lead into let me yeah. let me go back because I want to get into talking a little bit about rape, and what it is, and because one of the things I've been just studying all these. Um, 
interesting and terrifying reports. And I think it's connected, again, going back to manhood and all kinds of things. But there was this one particular study which says, when is rape OK? During a poll of high school students, Jacqueline Goodchild asked the following question. Is it all right if a male holds a female down and physically forces her to have sex if, A, he spent a lot of money on her? 39% of the males said yes. 12% of the females said yes. Is it OK if he forces her to have sex if he's so turned on he thinks he can't stop? 36 males said yes, 36% said yes, 21% yes. of women said yes. She had sexual intercourse with other guys. 39% of men said yes, 18% of girls said yes. She's stoned or drunk. 39% said yes, 18% of women. She is, lets him touch her above the waist. 39, 28. She's going to and then changes her mind. 54% of the boys interviewed said yes. 31% of the girls. She has led him on, 54% of the boys, 26% of the girls. She gets him excited sexually, 51, 42, and they had dated for a long time, 43% of the males and 32% of the females. I, I literally was shocked by this, but then read another study that just came out in London, which almost completely matches this and confirms these same kind of um, statistics. So I started to think, do people even know what rape is? <laughs> do you know, and, and I'm really, I know this may sound crazy, but I, I've been doing, like, when I traveled the world in, in this recent tour on One Billion Rising, I, there were actually a lot of men at events, particularly in the Philippines and in Bangladesh and in um, India. And we really had discussions where we were talking about what is rape, and I was shocked everywhere I've been to see the lack of understanding in boys and in girls as to what rape is. So I would like all of you to just say, what is rape? Can, can, we, can we define rape here? Um, you wanted to go first. <laughs> 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 you know, <laughs> <laughs> Peter and I are still It was with the, I'll my hand for Peter, really. Yeah, right, yeah, yeah, right, right, yeah. yeah, yeah. Pass the baton. You don't say anything, Peter? <laughs> no, please. Go okay. ahead, Jimmy. I'll pass the baton, Peter. Um, uh, I, I would, well, I, well, to answer your question, I would define rape as um, non consensual contact, physical, sexual, emotional. And to answer the second part of your question, um, people don't know, we don't talk about rape, we don't talk about sexuality. So I think a lot of, a lot of young men, a lot of men, you know, discover, fumble, stumble into it on their own. Um, based on what they're fed by their peer group and by society. So that, I think that, that, that's one explanation for why, why the negative behavior manifests. I, I would go with the, with the forceful, uh, yeah, uh, forceful. I, I'm stuck on the, uh, what the answer is. I'm embarrassed to say that, what, what it is, yeah. But it, it does have to do with force against another person's will for uh, some kind of gratification. Mm -hmm. So is unlawful is forceful, and we're talking about sexual intercourse when we're talking. Are we? About, we're talking about penetration of Are some we? force. Well, legally, when we're talking about rape. No, we're well, not talking even well, legally, because well, pen digital, was digital, digital well, penetration. Yeah, penetration. Right, that, that, but that, even without penetration, it's still Well, still that rape. should be. It, digital is yeah. without unlawful, because whether it's force or not, with her being intoxicated, it's still unlawful. Right. It's but, still unlawful. But that doesn't tell us what rape is. Well, let me say my other piece on that. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> to your stats. See, what I hear glowing in your stats is possession, mm -hmm. property, mm -hmm. object, particularly sexual objects, and the issue of value, less value, and how less that value is. Because mm -hmm. even when we talk about rape, in, in this country, you know, if one out of six women in this country would be raped, that's a bar, all right? And as terrible as that is, th at that point, we're talking about white, middle class, right? Christian, middle age, not middle age, because most women who are raped are 25 years or, or younger, but we're talking about white, middle class women, primarily when we say one out of six. And when, when we start talking about women of color, when we start talking about financially poor women, when we talk about non-Christian women, we talk about Indian and tribal women, the numbers get worse, right? They get worse. So the issue of value is overwhelming 
in, in when we talk about rape, when we talk about value, when we talk about possession, when we talk about property of, of women. So when the boys, the boys say, you know, uh, well, uh, she, she led me on, right? Or, or let me just say, let me tell you, quick, real quick story. Because you're talking about men in another country when you was making that example. I was talking to a group of higher education men, PhD level men in Washington, D.C. about 10 years ago. And I gave them an example of uh, she goes on a date with a guy, uh, she likes him, he likes her, she goes back with him, made a college age, goes back to his dorm, they're having sexual intercourse, and during the course of sexual intercourse, she decides, I don't want to do this, stop, I changed my mind. These cats were really actually arguing with me about who's at fault when he decides, no, I'm about to come, I need to finish. Mm -hmm. These guys could not just go with me on that. They could not see that clearly, you know, as, a, as we would say, a black and white issue, sexual intercourse is over. And they actually wanted to debate with me around the issue of whether or not at that particular moment he could stop. And then I asked them, well, what if her dad knocks on the door? <laughs> he no longer even has an erection if her dad is. <laughs> right? So the issue for me of p ownership, possession, value, the objectification of women, you know, is it, steeped in those stats. And those boys did not figure that out on their own. Mm -hmm. They learned it from us. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, four words, the absence of consent. Mm -hmm. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, but I want to go back to something, you, you know, you were just talking about, about value, about value. Because one of the things I've been really sh just so shocked about was all, they just keep, I was looking at all the Twitter feed that we were playing earlier. How many people wrote, she was drunk, she shouldn't have been there, she, look what she was wearing, she, you know, she's had sex before, the, the girls are skanky. I'm just like the language that people were using around those girls and how we devalue girls who are sexual, okay? How we don't even live in a world where you can be sexual as a girl and be valued, mm -hmm. right? And, and I think it's so fundamental at the core that men get to be sexual, that's okay. But if a girl is sexual, you can do anything you want to her mm -hmm. yeah. because suddenly she has no value. Mm -hmm. And I think I would like you all to talk about that. Like, what is that about? <laughs> and we're all looking at Jimmy. <laughs> and Jimmy's looking at me. <laughs> I mean, I'm. Yeah. Yeah. I'll Jump start. on it. Sure. Sure. Uh, the, the Madonna whore complex that exists in the minds of far too many men. Mm -hmm. uh, that it's, 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 a, it's an absolute sickness. And I mean, I should say, I, I, I have an eight year old daughter, and when I think about my aspirations for her, one of them is that she, she will be a three dimensional young woman. And I also have to confront my own unease with the fact that one of those dimensions is her being a sexual being. And I'll be honest with you, that's a con even in my own mind, it's a contradiction. I want her to be a fulfilled three-dimensional person, but sex, ah, can't even <laughs> say words. But she's married. And, yeah, yeah no, and it's, no. it's um, Even and, then, trust me. Yeah. <laughs> it, it's, it's something that, that it ties you up because it's like this is what we want. We want to live in a world of liberated humanity. You know, that's got to be our goal for being on this planet. And part of liberation is sexual liberation, of course. And so it, it's it's one of those things where that we, we have to confront very very directly. So that's all. That was a good answer. Yeah. Heather, I would love to hear other answers on this. Because I think there's something really about this that's oh, very yeah. profound. Yep. That somehow men get to live sexual lives and women don't. And when women do, they're to be punished for it. Well, and, that, and they're well, not to be treated. Back, it goes back to what Tony is. says. I, I think it's part of patriarchy and this ownership and control and that we ought to, as a culture, have control over what women do with their bodies. But the fear also of sexuality in women. I mean, it's, a, it's not oh, just Oh, talk a, about that, Peter. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, 
I, I, would, I think yeah. it's really important to talk about it. What is that fear? What, talk about it. Well, uh, one of the problems is I, I don't have it. <laughs> so that's a, I mean, you know, but it, it's, uh, boy. Help it's the power it. of it. That, uh, right. When we well, was talking yeah. about yeah. men, you know, one of the uh, aspects that we adore in manhood is power. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's, yeah. women's it's, sexuality is extremely powerful. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know? and, 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 and there is a zero-sum game aspect to it. Like if they get, which I think is part of the issue around the women's movement in general, it's like we, I guess we're going to lose something if mm -hmm. the other side gets something. Yeah. You know, mm -hmm. just the whole us versus them and the zero-sum aspect of if we can't all be powerful together. You know, there can't be power with, there has to be power over. That whole idea so permeates uh, certainly men mm -hmm. and uh, and some women, I think, in the women's movement because they've so co-opted this idea. You know, they've been it's in our culture that, you know, we got to be like that, you know, and that's completely wrong. But uh, I want to yeah. I want to just ask a question about that, because it's something I've been thinking a lot about, about every, just every every aspect of life. Just this word just keeps coming up, which is reciprocity. Mm -hmm. Reciprocity. I just, it just lives in me. And, and part of what I was thinking when I was, um, I, I spent some time in India and I work with this wonderful Ayurvedic doctor who, um, who you know, really helped me heal from cancer. And he was just brilliant with touch. He just knew how to touch the body in a way that changed literally the chemistry and with oils. And I, I just said to him one day, couldn't you just take young men who are like 14 years old and teach them this? <laughs> couldn't you sit, and I'm, I'm not joking. I'm being very serious. I was like, couldn't you just start courses where men came into a room, young men at that, age, that budding age of sexuality, and they learned what touch was, what reciprocity is. Because mm -hmm. the sad thing about this domination and this forcing and this oppressive sexuality is that all the real sexuality is being lost. Right. It's like you yeah. just you just finish it. It's right. done, right. as opposed to opening it and letting it begin. Right. And I think I would just like all of you to talk about what it, being a man. What are you taught about reciprocity? Mm. Well, <laughs> well, I tell you, huh? I'll, I'll go there. <laughs> yeah, I'll talk about it. <laughs> Objectification. Just a second. Objectification is dehumanization, mm -hmm. right? So it's so many layers of stuff that happens mm -hmm. there. When you talk about reciprocity, you know, I also believe, well, I don't have the exact stats, but I have my own numbers. It's like when <laughs> men and women, and from the time we're boys and as we grow into manhood, we're taught in many respects. It's not like a handshake deal, negotiate it out, or sit down and let me explain, but it comes out in so many ways that women are here for our comfort, our pleasure, mm -hmm. and, and yes, even our entertainment. Mm -hmm. that, that's taught to us in just a whole host of ways from Jump Street, from the time we're a boy. We're taught that, well, that there is no reciprocity. It's, I give 30 and I expect 70. If we're gonna break 100% mm -hmm. down, you know, that might be, you know, and then, and then what I'm giving, you know, is, is more like protection, take the garbage out, <laughs> fix the roof. You know what I mean? That's what I'm giving. Mm -hmm. It's those things that I'm giving. And, and then I have to go back to when we talk about this man box that so much of it is wrapped around you know, homophobia, mm -hmm. all right? And then there's one other thing I like to share. We've been, in, in our work with boys, we've been looking at this concept with boys of don't be a sucker, mm -hmm. right? And really talking with boys about it critical masses of boys around the country and someplace globally, you know, what does that mean? Mm -hmm. Don't be a sucker. Now, we know it, it means don't be vulnerable. Mm -hmm. Don't ask for help, mm -hmm. right? Don't have empathy. Right, don't be in control. And then one of the things, don't have empathy, but one of the things that comes out of it is that has become more and more clear to me. And this is, is, is you, you find it, well, I, I don't want to really want to say that. I wanted to classify where is, is, is more intense with boys, but it can, that, 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 can, that can be in, in, in uh, all fractions of boys. The, the point is, don't be a sucker also means don't be too nice. Mm -hmm. Don't be a sucker also means don't be too caring. 
don't be too gentle. It's like a lot of don't be twos. You can be a little loving, but don't be too loving. Who you're loving with, like your mom, is cool, but don't be too loving. You can't ask a girl out for a date. You can't say to another guy, she's cute, I like to ask out for a date. That's a sucker. You're supposed to say, who's that man? I like to hit that. That's a man, mm. you know? Who's that? I like a piece of that. Man, I like to tear that. You know the word. Oh. But no such thing as, she's cute. Mm -hmm. I like to ask out on a date. Do you know? She knew around here. Oh, can I ask? You know? So that's being a sucker. That's being less than a man. They call it a sucker. But we've been doing a lot of work with boys deconstructing this trying to figure out what we taught them through their eyes. Mm -hmm. You know, and, and we're finding that to be, it's frightening the heck out of me because it feels overwhelming also. But we're finding that to be paramount mm -hmm. in our boys. This concept of loving and gentle and kind and caring mm -hmm. is, is really challenging them, those notions, and then we see the impact in, in what's happening to our girls. Mm -hmm. just, the question was reciprocity. reciprocity. But, Ever see the movie called Outside Providence? You ever see that? The father said, sex is like Chinese food. It ain't over till you both get your cookies. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> also. <laughs> but is that true? I, yeah. It's gotta be. It's gotta I, be true. I gotta say though, I you would. See, I would love to see a, a world where reciprocity wasn't even what it was about. Mm. You know, that you just give because you want to give. Right. Right, <laughs> right but, but what I'm saying to you is that I think, like for example, when I was doing The Good Body, I was interviewing a lot of teenage girls, right? And they were talking to me about how they were giving oral sex to boys in high school. Mm -hmm. You know, in, in, the, in, mm. in homeroom. Yeah. And I was saying to them, well, what are you getting? Right. And they were like, what do you mean? I was like, wow. what are you getting? Right. I didn't right. even get into the, the, the oral sex and homeroom. That was like happening. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was like, <laughs> exactly. but, but what are you getting back from the boy? Right. And, and it hadn't even entered the equation. So I would yeah. like to just okay, begin well, with that, reciprocity. Yeah, okay, we can it. then move on to the, right. all the rest. But right. I think we're so far away from reciprocity. Right. Yeah. We're so far away from that dance that goes back and forth. Right. You know? And I think what you're talking about, that idea of being, to have reciprocity, you have to be open. Yeah. Right? You have to be open. It has to go back and forth. So both people have to be open to that. So how do we help men be open? Well, I think you've got to... I thought I would go down, please. Uh, I think you got to address the issue of shame in men. Mm -hmm. And shame, everybody wants to belong and be accepted. And uh, shame in men uh, really is about weakness, being perceived as, weak, as, as weakness. Mm -hmm. And I think whenever men uh, uh, feel weak, I think reciprocity might feel like some kind of uh, weakness in the midst mm -hmm. of that. That's right. I'm not dominant. So when you look at those two boys convicted in Steubenville, uh, they played the alpha dog uh, role. I'm not even sure it was so much about sex as it was about the socialization that they were the leaders, they were the best athlete, they were the leaders there and they were going to kind of show this. So I think until we get the uh, move men out of this shame, uh, it's... How do we do that, Joe? Uh, I, I think it's like this. I think shame uh, thrives in silence and secrecy. Mm -hmm. And until men start learning how to express their emotions and feelings and start really coaching up other men and younger boys mm -hmm. about the feelings and emotions. Uh, you know, I always say, I learned more about being a man from my wife than any other person in my life. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, I, I mean, it's really true, but uh, you've got to overcome that shame, and I think that shame issue has to be brought out, in, which is what's being done. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Beautiful. But if I'm shameful about my manhood, I'm going to manifest that maybe in power, dominance, control, those kinds of issues. Mm -hmm. So it gets back to some kind of authenticity of what is the masculine uh, soul? What does that look like? And mm. how do we nurture that? Mm. Yeah. <laughs> Jimmy? Uh, I, well, Joe said a lot of things I was going to say, so I just, yeah. I'll just say ditto <laughs> what he said. But also, I think, um, just to personalize a little bit, I think for a lot of us, I can say for myself, for sure, I learned reciprocity through failed relationships. Like not, you know, get, you know, having this pattern of getting into relationships and marriages that weren't sustainable because I didn't know how to create a balanced situation that was safe where I could cede power, control um, to, to the other person. And I think that, you know, th that's the unfortunate path for a lot of us to learn of reciprocity. I think, though, you know, just 
you know, Dave was telling a story, just to share a short story, last week I visited a program called Kavi in, in Bed-Stuy working with um, young black and Latino men um, at Wingate High School, and they've been around for over a year now. And it was interesting the conversation I had with these young men because these were all juniors and seniors in high school talking about these critical, profound issues mm -hmm. about trauma and safety. And the issue of safety was a big issue. Yeah. Um, you know, they, they felt they weren't safe, um, even amongst themselves, even in a room full of, of solely of young men, um, you know, reaching that place of safety where they felt comfortable, not just talking about the girl who's cute, who they, who they like, but just saying, um, I'm hurting, mm. um, I want to cry, I need a hug. Um, will you hug me? Even having physical contact with another man mm. was challenging for them. And I think, you know, for a lot of men, you know, the issue of, of not feeling safe, whether in a relationship with a woman or with other men or in society, is, is a big catalyst for them acting out violently or misogynistically. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. This is all just fear, shame, yeah. Yeah. safety. It's mm -hmm. all, it's, the fear is running all that. The fear of yeah. being exposed is yeah. less yeah. than. Yeah. yeah. We it's have this thing yeah. with boys that when we talk and working with young men, we call it cycle of consequences for them. So we'll first we'll talk about that man box and then how that leads to uh, low self-worth, how it leads to this inability to ask for help, how that then leads to lack of success and achievement, and then a big piece is stagnation, mm -hmm. you know, where they get stuck. And then when you was talking about, uh, Jimmy, we talk about trauma. I mean, you're blessed in life if you don't experience trauma. Everybody experiences trauma, but then there's the excessive trauma, the, mm -hmm. the, the, you know, the unnecessary trauma, mm -hmm. and then you go back to the man box, or we, with boys sometimes we call them manhood files, like computer files just running through their brains. You go back to that to then deal with the situation, and it's just a cycle. Mm -hmm. And one of the things we've been talking with boys about, that when we talk about the women's movement, many of us are part of that women's movement, I think it's a fair question to ask, because if we want men to be better men, I'm gonna say it. I said it a few times tonight, didn't I? I'm gonna say it. But <laughs> if we want men to be better men, we're gonna have to begin to find the space to have hope and healing for men. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, we've been talking at a call to men a lot when we, you know, as we develop healthy and respectful men violence against women will decline. You know, it works mm -hmm. together. But we have to have hope for men mm -hmm. and, and be invested in the healing of men. Uh, this man box is also holding men hostage. Mm -hmm. uh, we see the violence is, is, is perpetrating against women, obviously. We don't talk much about the violence is perpetrating against men, mm -hmm. you know, uh, against men as well. So there's a need for us to really begin to really look at manhood from a respect perspective of hoping healing for men as we are looking at it at, at, from a perspective of ending violence against women. Absolutely. I think part of Definitely. I think part of the problem, <coughs> we have a, a broken social contract between adults and children in this mm -hmm. country mm -hmm. yeah. and uh, to protect childhood. And uh, that contract's been broken for mm -hmm. a long time. Boy, has it. Uh, mm -hmm. And here's, here's what happens on that playground. Boys are, are given this mandate to be a man, mm -hmm. separate their hearts from their heads. Mm -hmm. uh, and then they walk around the playground policing each other. And you want to find that one boy that's just a little too outside the box, just a little too soft, a little mm -hmm. too gentle. All of us go gang up on that boy, and we mm -hmm. tell that boy to stop acting that mm -hmm. way. Stop with those tears. Be a man. Mm -hmm. And as eight, nine-year-old boys, Eight, nine-year-old boys, we walk away from that experience thinking, my goodness, I yep. hope that never happens mm -hmm. to me. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And we start conforming. Right we start then. building out this mm -hmm. facade. And it's where we also learn to be bystanders on that, uh, uh, on that playground yeah. as well. Mm -hmm. So I think we've got to mm -hmm. figure out how do we nurture young boys, mm -hmm. give them the freedom, the permission, and that's the, re the responsibility of, of adults and men. You know, we're yeah. the richest nation in the history of the world. You paint a picture of poverty, neglect, abuse in this country, it's a picture of a child. Mm -hmm. uh, that contract has to be reinstituted, and we've got to protect and nurture the hearts of every young, uh, so every young yeah. boy. And I just, I just want to just say one yeah. thing to that. You know, I, I once did this um, lecture at a college on legacy, like what's your, what's your legacy, and what do you wish your legacy had been? And one boy just raised his hand and was just brave, and he said, you know, my legacy is that I once had a heart, and I was in a softball game, 
and I messed up. And my father came and said, you're not a man. And he beat me. Mm. And he said, and I left my heart. And I want to go get my heart back. Mm -hmm. And then what happened is the whole class opened up and all these guys started saying, I left my heart. And everybody started having the moment where they left their heart. And because it was a safe context, you know, yeah. because it was, yeah. people could begin to share that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Jimmy, I'm sorry. I, you know, just, I mean, David mentioned this earlier um, about restorative justice. And I, th I think which is, the, which is a crucial part of this in terms of the justice system and how we respond to perpetrators. But I also think, you know, a, a big part of that, just for the perpetrators and those of us who consider ourselves good guys, is the idea of transformation. Mm -hmm. That even though we, we may have, you know, from childhood and on the playground, certain things were taken away from us going into manhood, but that we can, we can transform and go back to having that heart. The heart's still there. Mm -hmm. The child inside of us is still there. That sensitive empathy, we're born with it, it's still there. Mm -hmm. we, can, we can transform and go back, to do the work and go back to that place within ourselves. Mm -hmm. Yeah, mm -hmm. and t two things. First of all, um, a statistic that, that I think about a lot, and you said the word transformational, that's, that's Joe's work, is talking about what it means to have transformational yeah. coaches, yeah. Mm -hmm. like coaches who intervene in the lives of, of young people not just men, and, and actually shape and change their lives. 70% of kids in this country quit youth sports by the time they're 13. Now, I think that's a crime, because what is sports at its most elemental level is about friendship, play, and fellowship. And then when you turn 13, all of a sudden it gets very serious. All of a sudden you have kids losing their hearts on the softball field, and all of a sudden they get turned away from being able to do it. Uh, for women, it's also a different issue of access, actually fighting to be able to have that space, mm -hmm. uh, to be able to play sports. But, but you can see, like I'm a big believer that sports is like fire, and you could use fire to cook a meal or burn down your house. Mm -hmm. And there's a way in which if we can channel the power of sports to actually socialize people, mm -hmm. to, to really get out of the man box, mm -hmm. is something, and that's something that, yes, it does take money. It takes mm -hmm. smaller class sizes, it takes expanded physical education, mm -hmm. it takes more adults who do this kind of training so they can talk to kids better. It takes a real national commitment. It takes, we need a Marshall Plan against vi for violence against women we in do. this country we do. to take well, it on. And it's not to say it's gonna cure it, because I understand 42nd Street will still look like 42nd Street, and I get that. <laughs> Definitely, but if we agree collectively, look like forty seconds. No, I know, anymore. I know. That's a whole other story. It's but Disney now. If, remember? But if if we, the, the billboards aren't Disney, <laughs> yeah, the billboards. unless the Little Mermaid's doing some things, I don't know. But um, but the, but if we all agree collectively that it is possible to bring these percentages down, mm. if we agree on that then how can we, it would be immoral for us to not marshal every resource mm -hmm. to bring them down as much as humanly possible. And I, and I just want to say one thing to, to Joe. You know, at City of Joy in the Congo, which is this wonderful revolutionary center we have where women are recovering and from you know, serious sexual violence, there are 10 guiding principles that the women, we all created together. And they're like the guiding principles when you're there, and they're the guiding principles. You, and I think one of the things I feel we lack in America is principles. We don't have guiding principles anymore. Right. We don't have things that we believe in anymore. That like, And when you were talking, I was thinking, wow, couldn't we create guiding principles for humanity, but particularly for manhood? Like, what, what would guiding principles of how to be a man? And couldn't we all become coaches? Well, couldn't, we, couldn't we have we a will. world where we're all coaches, and we're beginning to coach a new manhood out at, and help boys and girls? Yeah, relationships. You know, what? We, yeah, relationship. Yeah. I think uh, we have to reclaim sports as a tool to serve this yeah. community and the healthy development of boys and the men and girls yeah. and the women. Um, and I think there ought to be a curriculum. Yeah. If they're going to be student athletes, then it ought to be teacher coaches. Yeah. And there needs to be a curriculum about the healthy development of boys and the men. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of what I do. I teach coaches how to integrate social justice issues, gender violence issues, into their, their everyday coaching. And I, and I work on every level, from the NFL to college to high schools. And the, one of my coaching models, speaking of the heart, is Dorothy from The Wizard of Oz. Yay. Now, uh, <laughs> there's two kinds of coaches. There are transactional coaches that basically use young people to validate their needs, their power, their identity. Mm -hmm. Or you're transformational, trying to change the arc of every person's life from the vantage point of the position you have as a coach. So when you think of Oz, Oz would be the epitome of a transactional coach. 
sends out the minions to meet his needs. No attachment, no connection, hides behind it. Dorothy's like every high school coach. You got all these kids that come to you, they already have this sense of deficit that they're not smart enough, they don't have enough heart, they don't have enough courage. And what Dorothy does, she uses a season, a Yellow Brook Road season to teach young people. It's not who you are that holds you back, it's what you think you're not. And the power to manifest the fullness of all your value and worth rests in you, it's being grounded in life. Mm -hmm. And if we ever reclaim, how can you live in a society that has the amount of gender violence that it does and not have that built into every athletic curriculum mm -hmm. uh, in an age-appropriate way all the way through and mandated in high school? Mm -hmm. I was just at a, at a two-day conference, uh, Tuesday and Wednesday, uh, of Safe to Compete, protecting uh, child athletes from child sexual abuse. Well, those statistics are absolutely staggering, staggering. in this country. Staggering. And they live in the silence, they live in the secrecy, mm -hmm. and they live in the institutional self-protection. And all this stuff needs, and there needs to be curriculum because people need to be educated. And it ought to be part of every education. They have it in sex classes, but there's not a more powerful person other than parents in the lives of a young person than a coach. Let's educate coaches, let's empower them, give them the curriculum, and then teach them how to do that. That's a step in the right direction. Mm -hmm. okay. I think there okay. needs to be a little more diversity on what we're lifting up, mm -hmm. you know? Because uh, there's so much more that's that nice. we can be looking for or making use of than sports, yeah. well, you know? Yeah. And I, I love sports, <laughs> you know? But, you know, that we as adults have to find a way to really embrace, you know? So, you know, it's, it's 500 people at a football game in some towns or more on Friday night for... 12 weeks in a row, you know what I mean? Uh, and then the band, the only band that gets any kind of props is the marching band, right? But then there's the school band, or the school choir, or the orchestra, or the chess club, you know? You know or, or the, you know, the spelling bee, the geography bee. The, the, there's all these other ways to lift up and embrace our young people. Because with all, I mean, with all we're saying, everybody is not going to play sports. Right, right. You know, and That's everybody right. that doesn't play sports gets demonized for not playing sports. Whether we're doing it purposefully or not, it happens. So I, I really feel we got to look for an abundance of ways mm -hmm. to lift our children up. And also, one more thing is this, this when you, one of you guys was mentioning about uh, the schoolyard. You know, and the kid that, uh, you know, when one kid is being uh, bullied and abused, the other kids know, I got to, you know, I got to poke my chest out and get tough right now to make sure that's not me. I think it's a call that needs to go out to parents. Because when I talk to parents about this, I talk to advocates about this, and they themselves make their sons tough. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? And while they're fighting against violence, yeah, sure. their sons are tough. Now, I don't mean tough like they're going out beating anybody up, but they're being taught a lot of the same notions of manhood. Mm -hmm. So the, the question that, this, you know, that I pose to advocates, pose to myself as a dad is because this is what folks say to me. I don't want my kid to be a pioneer. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? So when we get this thing figured out, then it's okay. Yeah, but I don't exactly. want my kid to be the pioneer. Exactly. Or I hear things said to me like, oh, well, I don't want to impress my issues on my kid, mm -hmm. you know what I mean? Those are my issues, you know. I don't want to impress that on my kid. But the truth of the matter is our fear, mm -hmm. while we know it's right, mm -hmm. but our fear of our children being out on the front lines will allow us, you know, to still be at the table, be at the march, be wherever, while our children, you know, are conforming to all the same norms as everybody else. And I, if I can just address that, and I'll go back to you guys, I think part of it has to be that it all has to be community-based. Yeah. It can't be that we're saying to, like I talk to a lot of moms who have the same issues with their sons. Mm -hmm. Like they, they don't want their sons to be perpetuating the kind of macho male reality, but they also don't want their sons getting beat up. Mm -hmm. right. So the, the part of it is like, how do you be that pioneer? Right. You've got to have people around you. You've got to have support around you to make that happen. You can't do that alone. It's, I, I think, just to piggyback, I think on what, um, what Tony was saying, and I appreciate you saying that. I mean, I think one of the things we have to talk about, I know you do through the call to men, is bystander, the bystander mentality, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. bystander intervention. I mean, when I, when I read about the Steubenville case, I was horrified at the actual act. I was more depressed that people stood around, that there were 50 people who stood around for hours as this was unfolding, 
as she was moved from one place to another by a car. Um, that to me was the most disturbing thing. And it goes back to, I think, what Tony was saying earlier about the not me, good guy mentality. You know, those of us who feel like, you know, we don't rape, we don't, we're not physically, physically uh, violent with women or we don't use misogynistic language, you know, we don't, you know, consciously we don't, we're not oppressive towards women. We consider ourselves good guys. But the problem is, most of us don't do anything. You know, we, we stay in that goodness spot. I mean, spot. this was my point. Yeah. Mm -hmm. We stay in that goodness spot. Um, and I think, you know, in terms of the, 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 but the bystander, you're talking about strength and, and, and being physical and being pioneers. I think it does start, start on the playground. You know, not to, you know, you're talking about poking your chest out. It's about standing up for the little guy or saying something if you see something. Mm -hmm. You know, not standing by when something happens. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I was going to speak as the one really non-athlete up here because I wasn't even supposed to be here. Uh, and I'm having flashbacks with my, you know, junior high school. <laughs> We're going to release you from that shit. No. Yeah. 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 It's awful. <laughs> Uh, that guy just like, oh, it's, um, I forgot all about him, but, um, <laughs> no, you didn't, you know, no, but, you didn't. No, I, clearly I, didn't. Uh, I was the sensitive guy that stayed home and played piano and all that. And that worked really well for me actually. But, uh, but I do <laughs> agree uh, that the younger, I mean, the t-ball, the playground, the stuff, you know, because by the time the kids are in high school in sports, it's selective to some extent already, mm -hmm. the younger it's you start, you those kids will become advertising executives. They will become, uh, you know, all bankers, all sorts of people. And if they learn what a healthy relationship with, is with everybody, boys and girls, uh, when they're five, six, 10, 12, before they start to self-select into, uh, you know, high school football and stuff. I think that's, you've got to start young and it's got to be a community of people. Mm -hmm. You know, Plato once said the two most important venues that create a just society were the gymnasium and the symphony hall. Mm -hmm. Both of them are about the integration of mind, body, and spirit. It's about right. the symphony of, of, right. of and life. And a team, yeah. yeah. And, and yeah. the reality, one of, why group activities, it's easier to change a group of kids than one individual Absolutely. kid. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So we need to do it in, in, in clusters and whatever that venue is, uh, whether it's sports or music, whatever, mm -hmm. but they got to be taught and, mm -hmm. and the hearts have got to be nurtured. And, and, and I would like to propose, this is something I've been thinking about, so when we get this billion dollars from all the different, um, <laughs> I think we need, you know, we have gyms in every city. Mm -hmm. I think we need crying centers in every city. Yeah. And, I, and crying centers for men where you just have to go and cry all the time because I, it, we started to have all the tears that men have not shed. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I, I was once in Kosovo, and I'll, I'll just tell the story quickly because I, I cannot say how much I believe that the, the, the tears of men, what the tears, the non-expressed tears of men have created in this world. Mm -hmm. You know, I was once in Kosovo, and it was right after the war, and we had gone to help this family. Um, who was living on, on their lawn, and there was an older woman, and she was this beautiful older woman who was living, her house had been graffitied and burned down, and she was living there with her daughter who had gone blind, and the only thing she kept talking about was her sons, like her sons had been taken, they hadn't come back for two years, and all I want is my sons, and we went back the next day to bring her mattresses, and as we arrived, we heard this huge commotion in the lawn, right, just a whole, huge commotion, and we moved closer, and we realized that her son had just come back after two years. And there was screaming and crying. And, and he threw his arms around me. Because I, I, was, I was just there. He didn't, you know? And, 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 it, and he just started to sob. Just sob, like, well. Like, and I had two thoughts. Oh my god, there is a dude wailing on my arm, OK? And the other thought was, oh my god, there is a man wailing on my arm. And there was this huge conflict in my brain between what I expected men to be and what the man was. Mm -hmm. And I even saw it in myself, the mm -hmm. conditioning. And then I had the third thought was, oh my God, bullets are hardened tears. That's what they are. Hmm. They're hardened tears. Mm -hmm. And I think we have to create a community where men can feel that they, and I just have always dreamed that we'd have crying centers where you go in and someone tells you a sad story or tells you something nice or shows you a sad movie and you just sit there with somebody and you cry and we just have years of crying where men get to express all these tears, you know, and, and, and the violence begins. To, but I say this not totally sarcastically. No. I think we need that as much as we need gyms. Yeah. You're right. We need, well, 
much, much, much of male anger is unprocessed grief. That's right. Oh, that, that doesn't just, if you don't process that, if you don't uh, dissect that, that doesn't just go away. No. That builds up like a pressure cooker. And you ask a lot and of men, they'll be explode. afraid they'll never stop. Yeah. And when you look at our boys, you know, act to the, between the ages of four and five, they still have permission to cry. Mm -hmm. But right around the age of four or five, and in our minds as men, consciously or subconsciously, we know is at that point in time, we're going to begin to turn them over to the world. I always say the age when they get on the school bus, five mm -hmm. years old. So between the age of four and five, we as men begin to cut the emotions off of our sons, mm -hmm. and crying is no longer allowed. Now, we know they're not going to stop crying at five, you know, because they're just not. But there is an expectation, and I, I'm naming stuff that, I, that men will not just sit down and say, yep, that's what I was thinking, but that is what we're, what we're thinking. Because by the age of 10, the expectation is he would have perfected it. Mm -hmm. So he got like five years. That today I'm telling you, you no longer cry. Mm -hmm. And you got five years to really perfect this. So by the time our boys are 10, 11, 12, they have, mm -hmm. you know? And, and girls, on the other hand, is they might be crying in here right now. There is no age to stop crying. Mm -hmm. But for boys, it's very, it's very, very clear. It's very, very purposeful in our lives and is reinforced in almost every aspect of manhood. Mm -hmm. this, this no shedding of emotions. And, and, and it, as you said, it's not only holding us hostage, it's killing us. Mm -hmm. And with us being, as men, being the dominant force in our culture, is wrecking the world. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yep. Just yeah. that, I, I grew up uh, three plus decades ago listening to Rosie Greer sing, It's All Right oh, to yeah. Cry. Yeah. Yeah. And it, it's, it's, and it's, it's humbling. It's humbling and upsetting at the same time how little we've traveled since then. Mm -hmm. That that would be a radical statement now for a football player to sing. It's all right to cry. And I, I think that we need to recognize that, you know, what, what did Woody Allen say about relationships? It's like a shark. If it doesn't keep moving forward, it dies. I mean, it's the same with, with struggles for human justice. Like if, if, we, if we think that we could just leave it alone because we're in a good place, it'll invariably move backwards. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and uh, yes, okay, we're gonna, we're gonna take a couple of questions. So why don't you just go ahead. Oh, hi. <laughs> um, not that the focus is not only on the two boys who committed this crime, but the culture that has enabled it. And I really appreciate also um, the pastor, I don't know your Joe, name. Joe. Joe, that you brought in pornography. Because I feel like this has been one of the things that has been totally absent from the discussion. What gives boys the idea that urination on this girl? That's mainstream in porn right now. Everybody, it's the subject that cannot be mentioned. Gang rape is a big deal in porn right now. Right. The idea of it's the objectification, the degradation, the use of women as nothing more than a plaything, that is very mainstreamed in porn, and porn is becoming more and more mainstream, more violent, more degrading, and more mainstream all the time. So I just feel it's, it, it was mentioned once, but it actually needs to be in the discussion much more. The other thing I wanted to say is, and it's a comment and a question, is that we have gotten sort of to the point in the discussion where this is socialization of boys and that boys need to be, there needs to be intervention in their lives early and I agree with that. But I guess I would like to know how anybody thinks it's possible that we are going to out-socialize the institutions of the entire system we live under without a revolution. I'm talking about the military where rape is most common, rampant, it's the trafficking and chattel slavery of girls and young women across the globe by the millions, which is fueled by military. It's fueled by the military, the US military in particular, but not only. This is big business, that it's the, the cops, the police, the courts, the laws, the laws in this country that are taking away women's sovereignty over their bodies. Forced motherhood is female enslavement, forcing women to have babies taking away abortion rights, taking away birth control. The, the rape has never been punished in this country by the law. I mean, the idea that we are gonna out-socialize all of that without making a total revolution, tearing this thing up from the bottom to the top, I just, I don't, I don't think it's possible. And I would like to understand how anybody thinks that that's possible. Sure. Okay. 
Do you want to answer? <laughs> yeah. That's a big one. Yeah, no, I'll, I'll say I, I don't see a disc I don't see a disconnect between fighting the so socialization of young men and actually uprooting the very systemic issues that you Me talked too. about. I think one is I think they're 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 connected to each other. Uh, you know, Dr. King said you got to give the people victories along the way. I mean, we need to be able to fight and win real concrete reforms in the here and now to make the lives of women safer. We need to have a Mississippi Reproductive Freedom Summer, summer to fight the fact that they're trying to close the last. Yes. We and in our yeah, exactly, exactly, yes. And I'm saying like like, and I think that we need to win these fights. We need to make sure that women have control over their own bodies. We need to do all these things. And, but par and that process is about giving masses and masses of people confidence that change is in fact possible. I also just want to address the pornography issue because it was actually on my list of questions, but we've gotten into so many other, um, because obviously there's, there's huge percentages now, and this is actually globally, that the first time most bo boys are exposed to sexuality, it's pornography. That's their first taste and that's now. their first touch of what, um, talk about lack of reciprocity. Um, um, yeah. But uh, no, I mean really, what do you learn? You learn that, it's, that women are commodities and it, bingo, there it is out of the gate. But I think going back to, and, and the revolution question, that's a bigger question and I think we, I don't think anybody disagrees that revolution is necessary. But the question okay. is, yeah, yeah, but we are talking about it. I mean, the, it, revolution comes in all different forms. But what I, what I want to say is, I think part of what we were talking about earlier is like how do we teach boys about sex? You know, and, and that was a huge part of this discussion. And I think if we, as a community, do not start intervening to teach boys what sex is, they, the people who want boys to get hooked into pornography, will do it for us. And I think part of it is, and I'm just gonna speak my mind on this for a second here, you know, having worked for years and talked about vaginas for years and put out messages we are still living in one of the most puritanical countries on the planet. This is a country that is terrified, terrified, terrified to talk about sex, although everyone's having horrible sex. You know, we live in a misery of sex, but nobody wants to talk about sex. And, and I, I just feel if Steubenville does not show us an example of not only the distortion of sex, the distortion of power, this, but it also is the lack of it just ignorance around sex. And I have said for years and years and years, and I will say it, if we don't start seeing sex education as the primary, one of the primary things we need to be teaching people, nothing's going to change in this country. Nothing. Because, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. How are we going to get to all this? We're not. Okay. We're not going to get to what? everybody, but go ahead. Oh, thank you. If we, if we are going to progress uh, with change, oh, thank you. If we are going to progress uh, socially and politically with change in this country, then how can we do it when, in the last election cycle, one of the two major parties nominates a man for vice president who calls rape a form of conception, and Senate candidates who call rape gifts from God and say the female body has ways to shut it down? Is that a rhetorical question? No, it's actually, <laughs> no, it's actually, okay, thank you, but how do we deal with that? I think we're, we're trying to, yeah. let me see. Okay, who, we'll who just take the that? mic, uh, Esther. Uh, hey, uh, good, good evening, I just wanted to say thank you so much to every single one of the men. It is too rare that we get an opportunity to sit and be in a conversation and hear from men about issues around uh, masculinity. I really want to. Um, I really want to switch the tone specifically, and ask the men to talk about the investment that men have in creating a masculinity where a healthy emotionality is rewarded. That we've been speaking about. Mm -hmm. I've listened to you all talk specifically about the ways in which men seek a reward for the hardness, for the disconnection, yeah. for the dehumanization, for the objectification. And so then I, I choose to root myself in a space of optimism and that it's not that it's not doable, but w what can we create that enables a masculinity that is rewarded so that 
as much as the other, the negative, the objectification gets rewarded, the positive and the emotionality does as well. But I also want to ask you about complicity and the ways in which we as a society, women and men, girls and boys, have really intimate relationships with violence and an expectation that violence will simply be a part of um, our lives. I think there's a real danger in sometimes the way we economize the men who rape and the men who don't, mm. because it makes it sound as if certainly rich white men don't rape because we root it in these economies that are based in poverty and color, and I think that that's really dangerous. Um, but I wanted you to talk a bit about mm. how we invest in that masculinity and how women can contribute to that conversation in ways that are not simply accusatory, mm -hmm antagonistic and hostile, because we all know that as women, the safer the space, the easier it is to be honest about the things that are hard to talk about. Because what I'm listening to is a masculinity that is so rooted in fear and shame, it silences the possibility of progress. Mm. Thank you, yeah. that's beautiful. Right. Uh, on the, on the, the positive outcome issue, how was that phrase exactly? The the first part of the, the question. How do you build a better model? Uh, build a better model. I mean, I, I'll build that into sex education and say that what I know is that if, if you can communicate that a fully realized relationship that has reciprocity, that has true uh, emotional investment in the other, and, and a, a give and take in, in the best sense of the word, not that it's zero sum, but you can both grow and become. I think the greatest compliment you can give someone is you're so becoming, right? That's what you want to see in your partner is someone that is becoming. And you know what happens when you're in that kind of relationship? The sex is better, okay? <laughs> so if that's part of what men need to understand is that actually there's a great reward, there's a whole lot of them that, that will come with it, but if, if this is about you know, sex and objectification and, and uh, you know, all of that, when, when you start to somehow through, through, I don't know what age you start, but you start to realize that, you, that, that a, a better relationship results in, in nothing but, but more positive results across the board, including the sex, I think that's a reward. It's no coincidence that uh, the divorce rate of former NFL players is 80 percent. I mean, and that's not a positive statistic, but it, it speaks to when you don't create space to talk about these things. You know, when, when I was hearing the question, and by the way, the questioner is Esther Arma, terrific radio host at WBAI here in New York. I want to give her her props for the <laughs> terrific work that she does. Um, and, and she talks about this stuff on her show. She's not just helicoptering in here with this. This is the kind of issue she talks about all the time. Let's be clear. Um, it it reminds me, I, I, have a, I have a good friend who's a big drug legalization person, and he's got two sons he's very close with in his 20s, and he's someone who also imbibes. Uh, and I said to him, like, look, you know, I'm with you on drug legalization and decriminalization, but I'm honestly worried about the choices my kids will make as teenagers. How did you talk to your boys as teenagers about drugs, and he said, I said to them, look, drugs are awesome, but if you go too far with them in your teens, you'll never enjoy them in your 20s, 30s, and 40s. And I think there's a message. There's a message to say, to say, to, to, say to teenagers, it's like for a teenage boy to actually say to them, look, don't go the route of pornography as a form of sexual gratification. Don't go to the root of objectifying women. Don't go to the root of seeing women as things. Because if you're able to see women as people as a teenager, your 20s, 30s, and 40s are gonna be filled with the kinds of satisfying relationships that will make the difference between you having a good life or a bad life. Hmm. And a great life. Yeah. Yeah. Did, that, did, you feel, did you feel the second part of your question got answered? No. <laughs> it, it was it was the part about how do we as women So the second part of the question is how can we as women contribute to investing in a masculinity um, that rewards emotionality mm -hmm. and doesn't 
continue the kind of complicity? Because we have such an intimate relationship with violence. Mm -hmm. Those statistics that you read talked about young girls' expectation Absolutely. that violence is simply mm -hmm. part of the way they navigate Absolutely. relationships right. is terrifying, but it's real. I work yeah. with those young girls. Absolutely. It's just what they expect. Mm -hmm. How do men help shift that? And then how do women contribute to how you create a fresh masculinity? Is still leaving? He's going oh. <laughs> <laughs> and he's going to go cry. <laughs> so do you want to answer that? Does anyone want to take a shot at that? Tony. Mm. No, no. What do you mean, Tony? Yeah, yeah. I mean, is it a I'm not a big women? fan of speaking for what women should do. Yeah, right. I'm yeah. That's not a big fan of that. Yeah. Exactly. That's I, I, what I will say is that whatever women are doing, it's, it, as it applies to what we're talking about here, so much of it still leans back toward men and our definitions of manhood. So I, I really believe that if we as men can get ourselves to a place where these qualities we're talking about, being kind, being gentle, mm -hmm. being caring, being nurturing, Mm -hmm. Right. Being loving that these become qualities, you know, of importance to us instead of good hit, good tackle, good shot. Right. Mm -hmm. You know and what you I mean? If we can get stuff these, back. Yeah. You yeah. And, and, and there are rewards, as, as you say, yeah. that come back. But that's incumbent upon us as men to teach our sons and other boys. And we as men have to deal with our own fear around. Again, so much of it is wrapped around homophobia. You know, so much of it is a belief that I can make my son gay. Mm -hmm. You know, all, all, all of this nonsense, you know what I mean? That, that adults deal with, that parents deal with, that dads deal with. My son's a mirror of me, all right? Or I'm going to live vicariously through him. You know, so we, we're constantly dealing with all these issues. But uh, for me, it's really that I, I, I work hard at my son, being loving, being kind, being gentle. You know, that these are qualities that I want to see in him, and I want to be the one to push them forward. But I got to go past my son. I have a way, way bigger responsibility than just my son and I, as I teach that to boys in general. Mm -hmm. Okay, you, you, you had your hand up, yes. Uh, no, sorry. Pat. Um, uh, so, so many issues here, I know, but I, I've, about the case, I am from Brazil and I work here with sexual health. I'm also American for a while. I transit between these two countries and other countries too. I have worked internationally too. So number one, I want uh, the positive side guys tell you congratulations for the, for the, the trial because it is a big victory for us to, to put in our plate anyway, because we have this kind of gang rape and this kind of all over. Even in Brazil recently, we had the same, more or less the same, but it was with musicians, you know, two girls, virgins, the detail, from in the middle of, you know, Bahia in Brazil. They went to get autographers after the concert because they loved the band. They loved the band. So somebody, the security said, okay, you can go. They are in the bus. You know, they are leaving now. So the guys were leaving and four or five guys raped the two girls for, you know, who knows this case. You know where the guys are? Free, okay? Mm -hmm. Giving concerts and being sponsored by big beer companies in Brazil. Yeah, exactly. And it's a big struggle for us to go after this. You guys at least has a just system that act very quickly on that, okay? This time. Yeah, yeah. yeah. this time. I hope so all the times, yes. But I want to talk a little bit about, we were talking about rape culture, etc., and different cultural difference. I, I, you know, and everybody's talking about pornography, etc., but I think... Also, it has to do here, this love, this obsession with pornography. And I, I would say bad pornography, okay? But we have a very good one. <laughs> anyway, uh, and it is spreading the word from the United States. Looks like, I don't know, it's a big uh, industry, I think, mm -hmm. also. But, uh, but at the same time, I'm amazed at how it's a, a culture of repression at the same mm -hmm. time. I mean, what, That's what is the link? That's because why. believe me, I am from Brazil. I moved here in 2000. Everybody say, oh, you're from Brazil? Oh, oh, oh all the women there. All the... I say, believe me, I now think, compared to America, we are the most innocent culture ever. 
Before here, I never ever saw there a, a magazine of pornography, how I saw here every single house right. that I go. If you look well here and there, you see pornography, you know? And at the same time, you don't permit that kids play together. I have a 12-year-old boy here. He is totally like uh, crazy because we came now, you know, from Europe and from Brazil, and he, he grew up there. And he plays, he has a sleepover with girls all the time. And here, people are like obsessive with separated girls and boys, especially their bodies. I mean, it's something to think about. Yeah, What's definitely. the big deal here? I don't know. Puritanism, I don't know, but something, but you know, and anyway, congratulations, thank it was a, a nice trial <laughs> and a victory for the movement. Oh, unfortunately, thank you very much. Unfortunately, we have to stop, but I, before we do, I just, I just want you each to have like one like closer sentence or two. Um, just, what? Mm -hmm. I know, I'm sorry, but we can't, so I apologize, okay? Um, I just want you to, because I, I, and I also want to take a moment um, to um, echo Esther's words. I, I, I really want to honor each of you tonight and to thank you really from the bottom of my heart for um, being pioneers, hmm. you know, for being pioneers, for opening doors, for being vulnerable, for talking truths that people don't normally talk about. And I think this hopefully will start to create a path and a door opening so other people and other men, other women uh, with men, men with men, and men <laughs> with women will begin to do that. But I, I want you just each to say from your hearts, like, why are you here tonight? You're looking at me. I am. <laughs> <laughs> well, oh boy. I mean, one thing is I know only a girl would be the mother of every child. So she is the creative force in this world. And of course it takes two to make a child, but there is a relationship that a woman has to a child that is so, unique and how we as men uh, I think that's part of the problem is that men don't have the same ability to feel that fundamental core connection to life and uh, I don't know what it is about that I don't know what drives it but I'm I'm here mostly to 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 try and figure out how we can get up underneath what may be a in, incredibly nearly intractable problem that has been just ridiculously exacerbated by the society, the culture that we have built. I, I will just say that my belief is the system begins and ends sort of with the idea that the divine isn't in any of us, but it's between all of us and between everything. God is in the relationships, whether it's a cellular level or a cosmological level, that's where God is, I believe that. And if we have lost relationship to transaction, which I think is what trafficking, what pornography, what all these things are, it does create a completely uh, disassociated world. And we gotta stop it. Thank you, beautiful. Oh. Jimmy? <laughs> right. um, in writing about the civil rights movement, James Baldwin, um, one said that the older generation has a responsibility to carry the light for the younger, genera younger generation. And I think that I'm here because my hope and expectation is that someone who's in the audience will see us or see us on the sh live stream um, and be inspired to carry the light forward when our work is done. Um, someone, I'm, my hope for being here is that someone who looks like me, a man of color, will stand up on this issue as well. Um, I'm also here for the woman I love in my life, my daughter, my partner, my mother, everyone, all the women in my life who, who, care, who care for me. Mm. Well, I'm here, you know, for those reasons, uh, I, I just believe in the inherent value and worth of every human being. And uh, we need to create a society that's more hospitable and uh, just and fair and inclusive of all human beings. And through my own life's journey, uh, I'm a survivor uh, myself, but I've spent three areas in my life. One, I've always studied men. Uh, how do we raise men that can break a boy's body and at the same time create men that can put an arm around a boy and help nurture and bring healing and hope? A uh, second issue, uh, because of my own life experience, uh, I've always identified with the oppressed. And, and there's a sense of solidarity in the midst of that to help create that. And the third issue, this based on my own spirituality, is this issue of theodicy. 
uh, how can there be an all good, all powerful God in the midst of so much suffering, so much injustice, so much pain in this world? So I'm here just on my own life journey as I try to find my answers and I'm thrilled to have been brought into your presence and uh, with the heroes up here that uh, I greatly admire. So that's why I'm here. I don't know, Eve, at this point in time in my life, uh, I, if I would say it as simply as possible, I wouldn't know where else to be. I, you know, I, I don't know what else to do but to do what I do. And I'm not by any stretch of the means perfect as a man, but uh, I know that this is where I'm supposed to be. This is what I do, you know? Uh, and I didn't come that way by choice. It was women that demanded that I be here and that this be what I do, you know? And uh, women with a lot of patience and tolerance because they had to stay at the table with me. They made investments in me, you know? Uh, and I have to honor that. Uh, and when I think, uh, you know, I, I'm real clear that women, when we talk about men's violence against women, women have taken this thing, in my estimation, about as far as they can go on their own. And so from this point forward, we will probably just continue to react to the violence. And I, I'm sure that women will see to it that punishments and consequences get stiffer and, and get more expedient. I believe women will see to it that that happens, but that's still responding to the crime, uh, responding to the violence, uh, and that men really have to be part of the solution. All right, if we're gonna put a dent in this thing or get even remotely close to ending it. And then I never forget, I get emotional when I just think about it, when this nine-year-old boy in the city of Milwaukee said to me when I asked him, you know, what would it be like for you? And that's exactly how I asked him. What would it be like for you if you didn't have to live with this man box? Mm -hmm. You know, and uh, he said to me he would be free. Mm -hmm. And that still nags at me when I think about him. And it helped me to get clarity that my liberation as a man is totally entwined, mm -hmm. you know, to the liberation of women. Mm -hmm. You know, that neither of us are free, you know, without each other. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Shit, I, I'm here. <laughs> I'm here. I'm here because Eve Ensler asked. <laughs> um, but and, and let's 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 seriously be honest about that. Right. Eve said we're doing this. I said let's do it. Um, and but I, I I would leave you just say I'm also here because. Uh, one of my heroes, uh, Frederick Douglass, said, power concedes nothing without a demand. And I think it's time we start making some demands. Uh, we need to demand full reproductive equality for women in every facet of their reproductive lives. Um, we, need, uh, we need to demand an end to violence against women. And we need to demand the resources necessary to make sure that we have the right kind of education to make sure that the next generation of men are, are brought up to respect their sisters, respect their mothers, respect their daughters. And we have to start making these demands and I hope you guys join me in making those demands because that's the only way I see this change happening. Thank you, thank you. I, I, just, I just wanna say upon closing, just a couple of things. Um, this, is a, this is a conversation that is going to continue. And I want to thank the, just the brilliance and the depth and the hearts mm -hmm. that were present here tonight. There are many men um, and groups working on these issues, men ending violence, a men can stop rape, futures without violence in San Francisco, connect with Quentin Walcott, Jackson Katz, Michael Kimmel, Rob Oaken at voicemail, Byron Hurt, Don McPherson, Mal Malika mm. Doug just started another amazing breakthrough program called One Million Men and One Million Men Program. And there are all kinds of groups you can get involved in if you are a man and if you are a woman, if you want to work on um, men ending violence against women. But what I want to say is what I hope is that this evening really begins a conversation. I want to do a series. I want to keep talking because I feel like the more we can talk and the more people we can talk to, the more we can begin to come up with principles. I'm really interested in having principles. What are the principles that form our masculinity and inform us building a community where men get to be free as, as we all get to be free when they stop having to be in, in the man up 
position. And I, I want to thank this audience, too. You've been amazing and receptive and <laughs> wonderful. And I want to thank the Paley Center and everybody for hosting this evening. And I hope you'll stay in touch. Um, connect with V-Day because we have V-Man's um, program and we're going to be working closely with the call to men and all the people up here. And I hope we can start really putting out calls, like getting all the sports organizations in this country to start redirecting money towards sexual assault programs, I think would be a really great place to begin. So thank you all very much.